Hey, seventh graders, Mr. Hallard with another one of our flip lessons. Today we're going to be working on Monroe Doctrine, um, number eight. Sorry for a little bit of the background noise today. Hopefully um, you can hear me. Oops, now you can't see me. There we go. It's a little bit better. Um, today we're working on Monroe Doctrine, number 88 in your internet notebook. You should have this cut out and taped in your notebook already. It's going to be a little flap, all right? You're going to open the flap right there. You're going to jot down your notes on the five W's. Right in here, you're going to create a little sign that summarizes the Monroe Doctrine. Okay, You have to have a picture in here, drawing, slogan, something like that, that summarizes the Monroe Doctrine. Good? All right, here we go. All right, sorry for, uh, for the lack of pictures here, but... Um, there's been some miscommunication between my new computer and uh, PowerPoint, so the pictures have been kind of getting lost in the shuffle. But James Monroe, um, actually that should say a little typo in there. Um, James Monroe, he's going to be the president after James Madison. He's going to serve two terms in office from 1817 to 1825. He's the last kind of, he's the last founding father president, which basically means he was the last guy that was involved in the revolution. He was involved in the Articles of Confederation, involved in the ratification of the Constitution. He worked with George Washington as a general. He worked with James Madison and as a Secretary of State. He was very influential in creating the Louisiana Purchase. He was one of the guys that Jefferson sent. So this person had been involved in politics for the last 40 or 50 years. His presidency is called the Era of Good Feelings because really Things were going pretty well during his presidency. When he runs again for president in um, 1820, he runs unopposed. Nobody runs against him. The Federalist political party is virtually dead, and only the only political party really working at this point is the Democratic Republicans. Um, during his presidency, we'll talk a little bit about, right now we're kind of focused on some, some the, the Monroe Doctrine is the biggest piece of, of Monroe's uh, political puzzle as president. Oops. So when? December, 20, December of 1823, James Monroe gives a, a speech to Congress, um, and it's part of a precedent called the State of the Union. Um, he actually gave his speech in person, which some presidents like Jefferson didn't do. James Madison was another one who didn't do. After this, more and more presidents actually come to give their speeches um, and now it's pretty much a precedent that, this, that the president, him or herself, will give that speech to the um, um, State of the Union. So the big part of the Monroe Doctrine was part of a speech that was basically James Monroe letting the uh, Congress know that this is going to be the foreign policy of the country going forward. Oops, went too far. Where is this going to have an impact? Well, the Monroe Doctrine is going to impact three places, and you can kind of see it on your picture here, all right? North, Central, kind of Mexico, Guatemala, those countries, and then South America as well, Western Hemisphere. Basically, that is going to be the areas that are impacted by the Monroe Doctrine. It makes a lot more sense when we kind of talk about what the Monroe Doctrine is. But... That, just know that that area, you may have heard that referred to as the Western Hemisphere. So, what was happening during this time period is something you're going to learn a little bit more of in global history was there was a lot of countries revolting against Spain was the big ruler of the year of those countries down in South America. Portugal was another one. Um, Britain and France had some in Central America, South America the Caribbean Islands. Um, basically what the Monroe Doctrine says is number one, America is not going to interfere with two things. Number one, we're not going to interfere with colonies that Europe already has. So Spain, you have a colony in Peru, America is not going to come and mess with that. Portugal, you have a colony in Brazil, America is not going to come and mess with that. France, you have a colony in Haiti, America is not going to come and mess with that. Um, second part of America is not going to mess with America is going to try their hardest to remain neutral in anything going on in Europe. We're not going to go over to Europe to make colonies. We're not going to go over to Europe to tell you how to run your politics, how to run your economy, how to run your so the social aspects of your area. We are just going to focus on 
working and building those trade relationships that again the economic tie going all the way back to um, Washington's foreign policy we're going to try to remain neutral in foreign affairs but here's the big one all right America is going to stop any new colonization in Europe by Western in the Western Hemisphere they were very vague on this they didn't exactly say how or why or what they would do but they said any future colonization in by Europe in the Western Hemisphere is going to be stopped by the United States this is a big big jump in foreign policy we're basically going away from saying we are neutral to now we are going to be more active. We're getting, we, we never really were isolationists. We were kind of borderline that. All we wanted to do is trade. Um, we're getting past the embargoes. We're getting past this neutrality. We are going to be active in foreign policy in the Western Hemisphere. So why would we do this? Okay, there's a big economic reason. We just said all of those countries are becoming free. America wants trade partners. America industry during this time period, which is what we're going to be talking about when we get done with this unit, America's industry is start to build up and start to pick up. We need markets for our products. New countries like Bolivia, Mexico, Haiti, even Brazil are going to be good countries that we can trade with, that we can sell our products to. We want to have good relations with them. We want to be very involved with those countries and make them our trading partners. Because remember, we talked about colonies we're not going to be allowed to trade with those colonies. Remember, all these European countries are still using mercantilism. So Spain is not going to allow us to trade with their colonies. France is not going to allow us to trade with their, co their colonies, etc. Also, it's a political sign that things are changing. We're changing foreign policy because America is starting to get their act together. The War of 18 was a wake-up call. We have to be ready and be active. We can't let things just keep happening, keep happening, keep happening, and then react to something when we're not ready. So America is starting to get ready. We're, we're starting to kind of provide for our military, provide for our Navy and things like that. And we're growing in size. We're starting to, to get this idea of America going from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. We've, also, we've already added the Louisiana Purchase. And we think it's time to take that influence, that democracy that we've been building as, at this point for the, for the last 30, 40 years and start to spread that out to other countries looking for the economical and political benefit, obviously, for the United States. All right, that's our flip lesson for today. If you have any questions or comments, again, always hit me up on Schoology. Either send me a direct message if you're looking for a question just for me or post something onto the Schoology board if you think one of your uh, classmates can help you out on that. Until next time, sound fears. Out, out.